In this video, I want to talk about the properties of therapeutic ultrasound. As I discussed in the earlier presentation on the physics of ultrasound, ultrasound is just high frequency sound waves. Sound waves with a frequency between 20 hertz or 20 cycles or waves per second and 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz are considered audible to the human ear. Ultrasound then is defined as sound above 20 kilohertz or above the limit of human hearing. Therapeutic ultrasound of the type that is typically used uh, in the clinic by therapists is one to three megahertz or one to three million sound waves per second. Diagnostic ultrasound, the kind that comes up with a image, ranges from two megahertz to 18 megahertz, but uses a much lower intensity than therapeutic ultrasound does. The ultrasound is generated by a piezoelectric crystal. The ultrasound transducer, or what we sometimes call the sound head, has a piezoelectric crystal usually right behind the faceplate on the sound head. And that piezoelectric crystal will deform in one way when current is run through it in one direction. And when the current is reversed as an alternating current, the uh, piezoelectric crystal deforms in a different way. And that uh, alternating deformation is what creates the sound waves. Just like if you were to look at a speaker and see the speaker vibrating or uh, coming back and forth, uh, the piezoelectric crystal doesn't actually move, but it deforms and creates the sound waves that way. Ultrasound tends to be collimated. That is, it consists of longitudinal sound waves that project from the ultrasound transducer in more or less a straight cylinder with a uniform diameter. This ultrasound beam tends to not spread out or narrow on its own. So as you can kind of see in the image here, the ultrasound is projected in a particular direction and covering a particular area. And that's very different from audible sound, which you can hear as long as you're within range in any direction. The implications of this for therapy is that if you're trying to ultrasound a particular structure, you have to make sure that that structure is within this collimated beam. Attenuation is the loss of energy in the ultrasound beam, and that energy is lost both due to scattering uh, and scattering happens with reflection and refraction. We talked about that in the video on ultrasound physics. And also absorption. Absorption is what causes the thermal effects of ultrasound. That is the sound waves are absorbed in the tissues. So ultrasound heats by conversion. Ultrasound itself is not hot doesn't really have a temperature, it's just a high frequency sound wave. But it is converted to heat in the tissues because those sound waves move the tissues back and forth and the friction developed in the tissues is what develops the heat. Different tissues in the body will absorb ultrasound energy at different rates. As a result, different tissues will heat up at different rates in response to ultrasound. Some tissues that have less absorption of ultrasound energy would be things like fat, water, and blood. Ultrasound passes through those fairly easily without much absorption, so it can't heat those very well. The things that have more absorption of ultrasound are more dense tissues uh, like tendon or ligament or bone. Uh, 
and those denser tissues will absorb more of the ultrasound and therefore heat up much faster than the tissues that don't absorb the ultrasound energy so much. There is another factor that affects how ultrasound energy is absorbed in human tissues, and that is the frequency of the ultrasound. One megahertz, one million waves per second, being a lower frequency will penetrate further than three megahertz, three million waves per second, being a higher frequency. So one megahertz penetrates far as we know, five centimeters and three megahertz, as far as we know, penetrates about three centimeters with good heating. We haven't really tested the limits of three megahertz ultrasound past three centimeters deep at this point, so we don't really know what it does beyond that, uh, but it does heat well at least to three centimeters deep. Now you remember on the previous slide where we talked about the ultrasound beam being collimated, that is more or less shaped like a cylinder, it appeared in the illustration that within that cylinder, the ultrasound was distributed evenly throughout. That is true in the best case scenario. However, just the physical limits of building a crystal make it not true in real life. So an ultrasound beam is actually not uniform in the energy that it emits. Um, it'll have what sometimes is called hot spots or areas within the ultrasound beam where the ultrasound is much more intense than it is in other places in the ultrasound beam. This is measured with the beam non-uniform ratio or the BNR. And the beam non-uniform ratio, or BNR, is the ratio of the highest intensity found anywhere in the ultrasound beam, which we call the spatial peak intensity, that is the peak intensity across the space of the beam, to the spatial average intensity. So basically, it's the ratio between the most intense spot within the beam to the average intensity across the beam. If the BNR were one to one, that would mean the spatial peak and the spatial average intensity were the same. And that's what would be ideal. And that's what would be uh, the case if it were an actual totally uniform beam. However, it's not. So here you can see a graphic recent representation of a couple different BNRs. On the left, what you see is a ultrasound beam that looks you know, reasonably uniform, but you can see there's some spots that are a little higher than others, and the, the height in this case is uh, the intensity in the beam. Um, but it's pretty uniform, so that actually has a BNR of two to one that is the spatial peak intensity, the most intense part of the beam is twice the intensity of the spatial average intensity or the average intensity across the beam. On the right, you'll see illustrated a BNR of six to one. And you can see um, that little pointy thing in the middle, it just looks unpleasant. And what we have there is uh, so that little peak that's uh, way up in the middle is six times more intense in the energy, the ultrasound energy, than the average intensity across the beam. So if you actually had a BNR of six to one and you set your intensity on the machine to let's say one watt per square centimeter, that would be your spatial average intensity, uh, you would have somewhere in the ultrasound beam a intensity of six watts per square centimeter if your BNR was six to one. Obviously, that would create some problems uh, in terms of accomplishing or uh, doing what you actually think you're doing uh, when you're setting your parameters on the machine.
Now the BNR is uh, simply an attribute that is manufactured into the piezoelectric crystal. So how well the piezoelectric crystal is made is what determines the BNR. And after it's manufactured, it doesn't really change. So the BNR is not something that you're setting on the machine or you're selecting. It just comes that way. And some machines will have a lower BNR and some machines will have a higher BNR. Uh, but with all machines, at least in the United States, uh, that BNR should be labeled either on the transducer or on the cable that's attached to the transducer uh, that is required by the FDA. Now, a lower BNR, you'll remember the picture on the left in the previous slide, uh, means that that treatment is going to be more uniform throughout the beam, uh, more accurate because you know where you're getting the energy, and also more comfortable because you don't have a single point where it's really intense. So BNR is an important consideration for therapeutic ultrasound, but it's a consideration that has to be taken when you are actually purchasing the ultrasound machine in the first place. All other parameters being equal, like uh, you know, spatial average intensity and um, duration and all that, a treatment with a BNR of six to one is going to be quite painful compared to a treatment with a BNR of two to one. And we'll see that on the next slide. Now, before I talk about this study, I wanna point out ultrasound should never be painful. Your client may feel a feeling of warmth with the ultrasound and that's fine, but it should never be painful. If it's painful, you need to change your parameters or discontinue. Nonetheless, uh, back in 1996, uh, there was this study done where they actually implanted thermometers into muscle tissue and then uh, applied ultrasound with two different sound heads. One had a BNR of six to one, one had a BNR of two to one. You can see in the second column here that they both, uh, both treatments increase the temperature in the muscle about the same amount, approximately three degrees Celsius. But the people that were treated with a BNR of six to one rated their pain as seven out of 10 and the people that were treated with a BNR of two to one rated their pain as four out of 10. Now again, in an ultrasound treatment in a clinic, there shouldn't be any pain from the ultrasound. But here you can nonetheless see, uh, as you can imagine from that image of the BNR where you had that spiky little point in the middle for six to one, that that can cause some pain uh, because you have some really, really intense um, ultrasound in a particular area rather than it being spread out evenly. That BNR becomes particularly important when you are working uh, on a part of the body that doesn't have a lot of soft tissue. And so typically with that, I would think then of the upper extremity. So in the arm, particularly in the you know, elbow, forearm, wrist, and hand, you, you don't have a ton of soft tissue. So if you uh, had a high BNR, you wouldn't have a lot of soft tissue to absorb that uh, high uh, spike in intensity. And so BNR is something you really wanna think about uh, when purchasing a, a machine for use in the upper extremity. Another property of ultrasound is that within that collimated ultrasound beam, there's a near field and a far field. In the near field, the ultrasound beam is well collimated, that is, it's a nice cylinder, but the intensity uh, is not very uniform, thus the beam non-uniformity ratio that we just talked about. In the far field, the beam is more divergent, that is, rather than be a cylinder, it, it tends to spread out a little bit, um, but the intensity in the far field is more uniform. As far as how this influences therapeutic ultrasound, uh, it's not something we can really change. And the most of the 
structures that we're going to try to target with our therapeutic ultrasound are going to be in the near field. But I wanted you to be aware of this because you may see this in the literature. Ultrasound of the frequencies that we use in therapy, like 1 and 3 megahertz, will attenuate very quickly in the air. Basically, when it hits air, it pretty much stops. And it is reflected in uh, any interface between air and soft tissue because of the density change. So in order to get the ultrasound energy from your transducer into the body tissues, you need some sort of a coupling agent. Generally, what we use for this is ultrasound gel, which transmits ultrasound energy quite well. Um, other things that could be used would be water, if you did it underwater. Um, there are other substances that you may think are kind of like ultrasound gel that don't transmit ultrasound so well. Some examples there would be hydrocortisone cream or Vaseline or Eucerin, and all of those block ultrasound uh, completely. So you want to make sure that you're using a coupling agent like ultrasound gel that transmits ultrasound well. And the other thing you want to be sure of is that the client hasn't put some sort of lotion or cream on their body where you're ultrasounding that's going to block the ultrasound. So it's probably a good idea to have your client wash that area with soap and water or wipe it with an alcohol pad before you do the ultrasound. And here are the references that I cited in this presentation on the properties of ultrasound.